nine o'clock Tuesday my favorite night is it yours and so we're gonna kick off but you know I always get on here and ramble um, I kind of like sitting down here on the floor. It's kind of fun. Right there, yeah. Um, so how many of you got to see my parents last week? Okay, can we just give them a round of applause because they were amazing and so many people have said to me, oh my gosh, your parents were awesome. I loved watching them. And they had almost 300 views, you guys. So that's awesome. I love you, mom and dad. Thanks for coming on. Okay. So, Tuesday night, ReLive, welcome to ReLive, where we talk about all the things. I'm not going to sit on the floor the entire night, but I don't know, I might. You never know. It's my show. I can do what I want. Um, tonight, I have with me not just one, but three amazing people that volunteered to come and spend an hour or so with me, and I'm feeling so blessed because that, these three people came with me. So, um, thank you all for watching. Tonight, we're going to talk about breast cancer awareness. Today's October. Can you guys believe it is October already? Yeah. It certainly didn't feel like yes, October, did it? Did it? <laughs> oh, man. I wore like a sleeveless dress to work today and sandals. I'm really loving this weather. But of course, wouldn't you know, yesterday they closed our neighborhood pool. Ah, bummer. Yeah. yeah. Bummer. So we didn't get to enjoy it. So whatever. Um, so tonight I have three special guests that we're going to talk about breast cancer awareness. I have a survivor, a previvor, hmm, and can you guys believe I got a doctor to come on my show? It's <laughs> awesome. Okay, so let me look at my notes here because I'm getting kind of lost and I talk all over the place. So um, welcome, ladies. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. You. I'm going to introduce to you who we have on the panel, and then we're going to go back and hear the stories, and then we've got some questions. And as we go through tonight, I would really encourage you guys, hello, we have, uh, like, two people that have been through it and, like, Somebody that like helps with it, I, like treats it, but you don't really treat exactly. it. Yeah. Um, we have a knowledge base here. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would encourage you to use the chat feature tonight and ask us any questions. Um, and if you want, it would be interesting to see how breast cancer has affected your family. So if you want to just, like, if you know somebody, just do, like, a raise your hand or a me or something, or maybe it's even you. So let's start with the introductions. I'm going to move this so I don't accidentally end the video. All right, so we have Heather Clough, right? I said Clough. Right. Clough. I always mess up. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Heather Clough. Okay. I met Heather about probably five-ish years ago like that, yeah. in Mops, Moms of Preschoolers. Woo Yes, so yes. that's how I know Heather. And then we have Andrea Bornino, who I also met in Moms of Preschoolers also about five years ago. Five years ago. But what's really cool is Andrea's son and my son Liam are in the same class. So we always hear things and we have our own special chat with another mother. So we always know what's going you on. Stay in the loop. So I find this out, you found us out, we all know what's going on. We're like, did you know that this happened? Or is there a spelling <laughs> test tomorrow? Are we supposed to know this already? <laughs> Are we supposed to be studying for something? Today I was feeling super overwhelmed. I'm like, I need to drop down to part time. I cannot handle <laughs> the second grade business. <laughs> well, they're um, surviving. They are surviving. They're, surviving. they're doing a quite, time. quite well. Right. Um, I think they're really enjoying being with each other. I agree. And then we have Dr. Erin Ramirez, who is a local OBGYN. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Am I saying yeah. that right? And she's been in practicing for about 10 years. So she's going to answer some questions that I came up with. Um, I'm going to run her through the ringer here in a little bit, guys, with everything that's on my mind. And I met Erin through preschool, so not mops, but through preschool when our boys were in preschool together. So, geez, that's been, they're in second grade. Is yours in third or second? Second. second. So they're in second grade. So it was preschool and Erin and I chaperoned a field trip together where when I found out she was an OBGYN I naturally overshared because that's what I do <laughs> and she was probably like oh my gosh why did I get stuck with this girl <laughs> um, so she probably knows a lot more about me than she cares to know anyway so she graciously volunteered to come spend an hour with us tonight too so now that you know who's all on the panel I'm gonna get up in my green chair I feel like, um, what was the show, like, when we were younger, there was the girl with the oversized rocking chair? 
Do you know who, Molly maybe? Was that her name? And she I keep videos. thinking of Pee Wee Herman and they have the big purple chair. Yeah. Okay, well, it's not Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> but I feel like I've known for my green sure. chair, which my husband hates, but it is Thank like you. the most comfy chair. And I want to have it re-upholstered. Aunt Anita, if you're watching, I want my chair done. Okay, so Heather, you were diagnosed in 2015 with inflammatory. 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 This is going to be a hot mess tonight, guys. <laughs> um, so, wow, that must have been scary, huh? Yes. So, um, and an uncertain time for you to be diagnosed with breast cancer. Yes. So, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit of your story with us tonight. Oh, definitely. So, um, as she said, in 2015, I was diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer at the age of 31. Um, so, that definitely kind of rocked my, my world a little bit. Um, but it was... Um, back in like May, I had gone um, to, or I, I was nursing and I was um, noticing some changes in my breast, um, not able, like he wasn't latching on. We were weaning, so I thought, oh, it was kind of drying up. Um, my breast did look significantly larger and it was really itchy. Um, so I called the, the, my doctor and the nurse said, well, you know, you're probably just drying up on that side. And I was like, okay, you know, but I nursed two other kids. So I was like, something in me still felt that it wasn't right. Um, so I was already weaning him. Um, he was about, um, well, he was 15 months old when I was diagnosed. He was probably about 13, 14 months. So I kind of weaned him a little faster, waited a little bit to see if anything would calm down. Maybe it, you know, really was that. Um, nothing changed, nothing got better. Um, so I called again and she wanted to see me. Um, and she knew right away what it was, but she, didn't let on that she knew what it was. Um, so she set me up to have a mammogram done um, because she said, oh, it's probably just a clogged duct that needs to be drained. Um, so I was went in the following week, this was June, um, end of June, I went in the following week and um, had a mammogram and an ultrasound. Um, and they saw a lot of calcification um, and they scheduled my biopsy for um, the following week, which was um, like, uh, July 1st was when I had my biopsy done. And they also sent me um, next door to uh, my surgeon um, to get a skin biopsy done. And I went in there not really knowing what they were looking for, because I know they do biopsies for a lot of different things. And so I asked them and she looked me straight in the eye and said, we're proving this is cancer. And I just lost it. Um, so I'm gonna stop you there no, for just a minute. So they never said anything to you about like what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when I read that because as a patient, I feel like they should keep you in the loop. And maybe, Erin, you would have something there like, I don't know, shouldn't the patient know what they're doing? Well, it's hard it's not being in that yeah. position, you know, not being there at the time. But typically, you could see that both ways. I don't want to unnecessarily freak out a patient. Sure. Right. Um, but I usually try to go through the possible things it could be and mm -hmm. I always then kind of say something like well it would be really unlikely but we we would need to rule out mm -hmm. sure. breast cancer so yeah I think most physicians would at least mention that but in a young woman without a family history who's breastfeeding it's not going to be okay first on your list right. you're going to think it's yeah. going to be something else but yeah. certainly I mean I would have wanted to at least explain, like, you know, a biopsy, what we're doing with the biopsy is trying to make sure that it's not mm, yeah. something scary. Right. And, that, and that's when I asked her, and she, you know, told me, and I was just, you know, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, it's not, it wasn't even something that I even wanted to think about, especially mm -hmm. at 31. Mm -hmm. um, so they did the biopsy, um, and then they had me go next door and do a skin biopsy, and my surgeon, who seemed to be optimistic, and I think he really, really wanted it to be, True. the better you know of the outcome and so we had planned to actually drive up to my sister's idaho that week and just do a family vacation and um couldn't do it so she the doctor actually hand delivered my results to the hospital and said we needed this yesterday oh man the very next day i got a call and said you have um, breast cancer it's inflammatory breast cancer which is very rare and it's very aggressive um and uh, it had already metastasized to my iliac crest um, in your hip and a spot um, in my um, spine. 
So she said, your oncologist wants to see you today. Obviously, this was right before the 4th, so they were closed that next day. So she saw me that same day. The next week, I had all of my scans. I had my port placed. I had my bone biopsy, and that next Tuesday, I started my chemo. Um, so it was a very fast um, diagnosis, and everything moved along fast. Right. Um, and I'm very thankful for that because I had several people telling me, well, you need to have a, you know, a second opinion. And I'm like, they're not dragging their feet, so let's just you know go with it. And mm -hmm. if anything happens along the way, then um, we'll go with that. So I, um, yeah, July 2nd, 2015 was my diagnosis date. Um, I did um, five months of chemo. So I did eight rounds, which was every other week because it was a very strong, um, potent um, medicine. And that's why I had my port placed. Um, so that was every other week. And then um, I had like a two to three week break and then started weekly for 12 weeks. Um, I lost my hair obviously, um, but four years later, it's down it in the middle of my back, right. so it's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, and, you know, I had a 15-month-old, you know, I have three kids, and he was the baby, and it was very, very hard. My husband works nights, and um, it wasn't pretty at night, you know. Sure. I struggled a lot, but I had so much help um, that I never knew I had, um, from my church to mops to just people that I had been friends with, but we hadn't really connected in the last mm -hmm. couple years that just brought me meals would come weed clean my house like watch my kids selflessly while i went for a couple hours for my treatments every week um and uh it was definitely a scary time in my life but um god brought me through it for sure that's awesome that's awesome yeah. it's so cool to see like when you do go through a tragedy like that or something just kind of flips your life upside down all the people that come and, and mm -hmm. surround you yeah and it's like your tribe and, yeah it, you know and life gets so busy and we may not be there during like normal time of life but then it's just really cool to see how that happens yeah yeah um, you are selfless fortunately my cousin she lives in kentucky but she set up this website um was like a cancer or what i can't remember the name of it now but we shared the link and she had on there, like I would give her my schedule and she posts on there and people would go on there and say they'd bring meals or they'd clean mm -hmm. or they'd watch my kids. So I just have to go into that calendar and That's I could awesome. see who was um, doing what, um, but they would feed them usually, you know, and you know, it was, just, it was amazing. Um, so after all of that and these, at the end of December, I had a mastectomy and then a month later, um, just about a month later, I had a complete hysterectomy. Um, and then I started radiation. So I did um, 34 treatments for five days a week. So, okay. So the radiation then was to help get rid of the masses that are basically that are they, spread? They, so my surgeon said that they got all of the cancer. But basically he said the radiation just kind of comes and kind of cleans up anything okay. um, that could still be there. I did have 13 lymph nodes renew, uh, removed. Um, eight were good, five still shown kind of some um, cancer activity, mm -hmm. which is why they wanted to do mm -hmm. the radiation to kind of kill everything. Okay. So. Okay. So where are you now? Well, I am um, four years out, but I am officially cancer-free as of um, August of 2016. Um, awesome. Yes, amazing. I get scans every four months just to kind of check everything, but I do take a chemo pill every day. Um, and I get shots every month and that just kind of helps suppress my um, hormones because my cancer was ER, BR receptor positive. So hormones definitely were not my friend, um, which is why we or I had the hysterectomy done. Okay, that um, was one of my questions. Yeah. Also, because of the medicine that I'm on, they said they didn't want to trade one for the other because the medicine, the chemo pill that I'm on could cause, you know, cancer ironically uh, you know so it was just better just kind of remove it all um but the shots and the chemo pill just help suppress all the other hormones that excrete out of other mm -hmm. organs in your body so so did you have a full hysterectomy mm -hmm. okay yep wow yeah wow so this hot, hot weather has not been fun. <laughs> <laughs> i can imagine i can imagine thank you so much heather for You're sharing welcome. that with us and i hope that um hearing that story can help inspire somebody it can help you get through if you're going through it like know that there is you know light at the end of the tunnel and I just want to say real quick yeah. um, be an advocate for yourself mm -hmm. and um, if you ever need to talk you can always 
contact me through, you know, Rayan or find me. Um, I have friends all the time, like, I don't want to, you know, cry, you know, and they ask me, and I'm, that's what I'm here for. I've been through it. Mm -hmm. And I just want them to know that any little sign that you see any change, it's worth getting checked out because you never know. Mm -hmm. Um, unfortunately with inflammatory breast cancer, you don't need a lump. Um, so it's just other changes, um, in the breast also. Okay. So, um, absolutely be an advocate. That was mm -hmm. one thing when I was reading your story and how, when you called the nurse and she's like, Oh, it's probably just this. But then like, you were like, you know, I kind of like nursed two other kids. This just doesn't seem normal. Mm -hmm. So definitely. I mean, I think that we are our strongest advocate and we have to stand up for ourselves yeah, because definitely. nobody else is going to, if we don't. Correct. So that's really awesome. What was the initial, like, thought that went through your head when you heard that nasty little C word. Like I can imagine oh, what would go um, through my head. Honestly, that whole time is a big blur, but I know that I was just like my life kind of flashed before my mm -hmm. eyes because and everyone told me, well don't, you know, look up, you know, don't look it up. And I that was not nothing that ever crossed my mind. But after I got through it, I had several friends like, yeah, I looked it up and it was, you know, not really good, you know? It's like, thanks, but I'm here. Um, but there is a, a lady um, that is in West Lafayette that she is a 25 year inflammatory breast cancer survivor. Oh, wow. Um, and she actually is a former nurse and she founded the IBC, which is Inflammatory Breast Cancer Research Foundation, and she does mm -hmm. it out of her home. Um, and to know that, you know, 25 years ago, you know, with it being fairly new and her oncologist was like, I've only treated one other patient with this oh, and they wow. didn't survive. Um, so God, at, you know, got kept her here for a reason. Um, and there are more and more people that I um, have been put in contact with that have had the same cancer that I've had and survived. The fact that it was stage four and it already metastasized, um, it's definitely a God thing that I'm mm -hmm. still here. Um, yeah, your story is not over. No, it's mm -hmm. definitely not over um, because even my my OB had said that the fact that you have stage four breast cancer and you're still here. Um, so, and I fought for my life because I had three young kids um, and I had every reason to fight. Yeah, so absolutely. I wasn't going to give up. Wow. Uh, you said that you had a lot of people that came around and supported you and your husband worked tonight. So, and then how did your kids deal with this? I just can't imagine like my child seeing me go through something like that yeah well the boys were really young um and my daughter she remembers but she was still a little young she did help a lot mm -hmm. um and it, luckily i never got sick so i was so fortunate on that part um they did see the very very worst of me sometimes especially at bedtime because it was all that i could do to get them in bed mm -hmm. um and there were many nights where it was very ugly and i had to go in and apologize and ask for forgiveness because i you know was just sure. wrong them um but it it was tough there there mm -hmm. were times where um i just on the weekends i just couldn't really do much and my husband did so much during the day mm -hmm. um and there were times i had a few friends go put my kids to bed because i just physically couldn't do it yeah, um, it was hard, and I know that it impacted the kids, but I think that there's they see how much I changed because mm -hmm. I'm, and I thought I was fairly good person beforehand, but God definitely <laughs> has shown me, <laughs> and it's helped me to grow these last four years. Just He gave me a new life, He gave me a new perspective, mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely um, I think my kids are seeing that. In me. Sure, yeah, it's interesting how sometimes it just takes like one thing to change our perspective, mm -hmm. and it's a whole different. Thing. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you sharing You're your story welcome. with thank us. You for having me. Yes, of course. I mean, everyone is welcome on ReLive. <laughs> we talk about all the things. All right. So next up, we have Andrea, mm -hmm. and her story is a little unique. Before I met Andrea, I had never heard of a previvor, and I actually have known Andrea for a long, like you know, five years. But we just recently. Um, participated in, a, in, a, in oh, oh, oh. an event over the summer and she was telling us yeah like we're see it it mm -hmm. says muddy melons akuna matatas that was our mm -hmm. theme for our mud run that, that was our theme that was awesome so andrea why don't you educate all of us what a pre is and then kind of just tell us a little bit about your story okay sure um, I'm Andrea Bornino, and I'm a pre which is weird for me to say because not a lot of people know what a pre is. I know I didn't know what a pre was 
until I actually looked things up for what I had, <laughs> which is not what I should have done, but I did anyway, because that's just the nature of the beast. Um, I'm a previvor. A previvor is somebody who does not have cancer, but I carry a genetic marker um, that puts me at a high risk of having cancer. Um, I have the BRCA1 gene, so I have a glitch in my genetics, um, and it puts me at an 80% chance of getting breast cancer in my lifetime and a 60-ish something uh, chance of getting ovarian cancer in my, in my lifetime. So I have taken precautionary measures to um, try to avoid cancer as much as I can. Now, with my double mastectomy, I'm down to like a 6 to 10% chance of getting wow. breast cancer, which is way better than having to go through all those scans and everything every six months and going, is it, is it not, is it, is it? So, yeah, so I've taken precautionary measures and still have future precautionary measures that I need to take um, in my 40s to have awesome. a complete hysterectomy and things like that to get those numbers down as well. So, so you do have plans to do that? Yes. Mm -hmm. not, not looking to that 40th birthday. You, you know, know what? A couple more years for that, but not looking forward to that. <laughs> I had to have a hysterectomy, and I'll tell you what, best decision of my life. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about not having that monthly visitor, mm -hmm. but, yes. you it's, know, that's I haven't it. liked having to go through all the hot flashes on my own, but it's been amazing. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm worried about. I'm worried I saw, about the early, like, menopause, surgical menopause. Yeah. That's what I didn't I'm have most. a full, so I still have my ovaries. Um, so I will still get to go through oh, the whole chain. Yeah, well, well that'd be exciting. But you can tie if I take stuff to help you out. So you just turn the phone <laughs> Okay, what other do you want to share a little bit? Yeah, so story? um, so I'm like I said, I'm a previvor. I have BRCA one as my marker. Um, and if anybody has any BRCA one questions or genetic testing questions, feel free to contact me. I'm awesome. like Heather. I'm, I'd be glad to talk. Um, the crazy part about my story is we found out in the same month. Mm -hmm. Like you found out you had breast cancer, and I found out that I had my BRCA1 marker. And we have the same surgeon. And we have the same plastic surgeon. surgeon. Yeah, <laughs> and our kids are the exact same ages. Mm -hmm. Our last two are like the exact seven days like, apart. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It was it was crazy amazing because we had each other to go through it. With. Yeah, we did in so, in, in different ways, yes. and we were creative activities co coordinators together in Mops. Mops so like so, we yeah. just had like a huge story and just a connection, and um, it was yeah. a crazy year. It was a crazy it was a year. Crazy and, amazing weird year yeah, yeah it was and i think you had said that one of our surgeries was back to back i don't remember yeah. which one it was dr lai had me in first and your, oh, yeah. your husband came into the office and had that your was, surgery uh, next yeah Isn't that crazy? They i had a reduction back. like that year so um that was what that, that was, was what it was, yeah yeah, yeah. So. so it's yeah we have a similar story but obviously different outcomes different so, yeah definitely yeah. definitely so um genetic testing is something that if you are interested in um, I would highly recommend it if you want to know what the actual results are. So if you're a paranoid person and it's going to ruin your life to know that you have that genetic marker, maybe do it, but don't know the results. Let your doctors know the results. Or if you want to know, definitely um, talk to your doctors about it and see if it's right for you. I know it was on my radar because radar, my mom's like, oh, we have seven people in our family who have had cancer and they're all on this one side of the tree. And they're all, mm -hmm. except for two of them, they're all womenly type cancer between breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and cancer of the uterus. I mean, all seven of them, starting with my great grandmother to my grandmother to my aunts, and all wow. the way through. And she's like, you, they are suggesting that the the girls of these families get tested just to see as a precautionary measure, because eighty percent chance of getting breast cancer is a huge risk. That's a huge. If risk. I had eighty percent chance of winning the lottery, I would totally take it. But <laughs> breast cancer, not so much. <laughs> So, yeah, so um, getting tested, it's just a, a draw of some blood, and mm -hmm. you wait and wait and wait a little bit longer, and then you get your results back and see if you carry the gen genetic marker. Okay. So so that's how it is. And I, then you meet with your doctors, and there was a wonderful genetic counselor um, through Dr. Summer's office, and I can't for the life of me think of her name or find her name in any of my paperwork. She was amazing. She spent two and a half hours with my husband and I. Didn't rush us through the conversation of what is this BRCA1 thing, what does it mean, and she kept calling it a genetic glitch. Well, not, you know, we have kids. So my first thought of genetic <laughs> glitch is the glitch off of Wreck-It Ralph. Oh, yeah. I kept seeing, seeing Vanellope just <laughs> and, and, and like, yeah. glitch out. Every time she said glitch, that's the only thing that got me through that conversation. <laughs> he's like, I got a glitch. So I got in the car and said, I'm, I'm, I'm a glitch. You know, like, and he's like, stop it. So anyway, so um, it's just a genetic glitch that, you know, I've inherited a lot of genetic things from both sides of my parents, good and bad, but, you know, 
it's just how we're made up mm -hmm. and what God has given us. And you just kind of go with it and see what amazing things happen. With right. It. So as we taught um, Liam last night, we taught him the phrase, when life gives you lemons, you make uh, lemonade. Lots of lemonade <laughs> with it. Absolutely, absolutely. So with the whole um, preventative care, so I decided to go ahead and do a double mastectomy. I was a very large chested lady anyway, and I would always joke around, oh, if I could get it paid for, I'd get my, you know, breast reduction and make them smaller. And after having kids and nursing, you know, they get really big. And so, like, I was bouncing up and down when you do the jumping jack, smacking yourself in the face kind of, yeah. kind of a lady. So I was like... This double mastectomy thing kind of sounds kind of nice. Yeah. Ish. If I have to get it, I guess I'm okay with it. So went ahead with it and did the whole reconstruction mm -hmm. process with it. And in the whole reconstruction process, we called them my Franken boobies. So that was <laughs> made it kind of fun and made back their life. You go in and say, Oh, my Franken boobies, they're looking pretty good today. And then the final process, when you had them finished, then they were called my newbies. So these are my newbie boobies. Newbie and boobies. Briar was so little that she called them my boo boos. She nice. doesn't remember that because she was so little, but for the longest time she called hers her boo-boos too. Aww. And so that was always cute. Mommy, boo-boos okay? And I'm like, yeah, they're, they're better, they're better. And she goes, my boobies are good too. And I'm like, okay, good. You know? so, so that was always comical and fun and kind of lighthearted to mm -hmm. laugh about that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, so that was that was kind of a fun adventure. I imagine. So, and it's still kind of an ongoing adventure it for still you. Is. Yeah, so every six months I go in, I have my annual routine checkups, um, and then I have blood drawn, um, and I'm sure you do as well for the CA125 marker. Um, I'm not sure if you do or not. But, uh, I have um, to get blood work every month every anyway, month. so gotcha. I don't, there's a whole All gamut of things you just gotcha. test for. So. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have that done, and I think it's a CA125. One of them is the diabetic okay. one, and the other, okay, there we go. Okay, that's what we're getting. And then one of them's diabetic, and one of them's not. I'm not diabetic, but it's in the genes, too, you know. So oh, okay. Those are, is it the like cancer marker? AC and CA, they're confusing, yeah. One of them is one. The okay. A1C1 one is A, the diabetic. Yeah, there you go. See how that gets confusing? Sure. Right? Yeah. It's yes. two letters are the same. Yeah. It's just confusing. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. That's that. Awesome. Anything else in my story? Um, Let me talk see. about to see what I, I, was, I had a question, and my question was, um, so are you going to encourage Briar to get the testing done? I will tell her my story mm -hmm. and tell her it's probably an option for her, but my, uh, the doctors that I went to said, the first question they asked, are you planning on having any more children? Mm -hmm. And if we said yes, they would say hold off, and if they said no, they, mm -hmm. they said go ahead with mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I think once she's, once she wants to find out, I think... You know, that could be mm -hmm. your choice. Right. Okay. And then there was something on here that you you have surgery story, angel in the waiting room on yeah, the phone. Yeah, the craziest God story. It just makes, it's one of those eye-opening things. So we're sitting in doctor, um, the doctor lies surgery office area, and it's my husband and I. We're sitting, like, front row where everybody comes out of the elevator. We're the only ones in this space. And then there's people in the next waiting room, and it's super early. It's, like, 6, 30, 7 o'clock, whatever, in the morning. So we're all half tired, and I'm like, the night before, I had just had so much anxiety that I just, like, knelt down, and I just prayed really hard and, like, had the weight, but you know how you feel like the weight just lifted off of you and just gave everything to him. It's the craziest thing. I went into the waiting room, and we're sitting there, and, you know, we're trying to, I'm trying to keep busy. He's trying to keep himself busy, and you know how men are. Sometimes they're just oblivious, <laughs> but I don't think he was oblivious this time. I think it just, he just never saw it. There was a woman, and I can describe exactly what she looks like, exactly what she's wearing, and exactly what she sounds like. If I saw her in a crowd, I'd probably pick her out. She was just very distinct and very just unique. She came in and sat down right behind me. Brian swears nobody was in the waiting room the entire time we were there. She came in and sat right behind me, and I saw her, and she was on a flip phone, and she answered it, and she was talking to her friend about the results she had just found out about her breast cancer, and she was like, Everything that I needed to hear, she was telling her friend. It was the coolest thing. Like, everything's going to be okay. This is a great surgeon. Like, he's got steady hands. I've had other friends go through surgery like this. And, oh, my goodness, it just, like, just thinking about it just gives me, like, goosebumps all, all, over. all over. Yeah, and Brian swears nobody was in the office the entire time. Because I came out, and I was like, did you hear that lady, like, behind us talking so long on her phone? She said everything I needed to hear before I went into my surgery. And he's like, I, there, nobody was in there. <laughs> like yeah there was she was wearing the green like jacket and this that and everything else and he's like nobody was in there honey and I'm like okay 
There was somebody there talking really loud on the phone right behind me. That's crazy. Ooh. That is, that is a, little, <laughs> a really crazy story. So now, like, now I like open up a little bit more about like what I see and what I feel and what I hear. Like, okay, maybe that's God telling me this or mm -hmm. you know those kind of things. So that's another that's another re revive, we re revive, re revive, re yes. whatever we're doing to revive the questions. Yes, yes. <laughs> if you're gonna be on the show, so, you gotta get yeah. the name right. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I've been talking to like hundreds of kids today. Yes. You know, it's okay. I know. I know. For those of you that don't know, Andrea is a um, PE what's teacher. PE teacher, yes. Teacher. Not a gym teacher anymore. Well, that's that's not what I almost said. The gym so. is my office. No, I'm not one of those teachers. I'm a gym teacher. I'm Mrs. Jim. <gasps> Mrs. Jim. Yeah. Awesome. Can I add something real quick? Absolutely. I forgot to say my story. So I had the, the BRCA gene test also, which was normal. Um, and I forgot to say that there's no history of breast cancer at all in my family. My mom's mom had ovarian cancer. Um, my grandfather had colon cancer, and I had another grandfather that had spinal cancer. It's cancer in the spine. It went away and then came back in other areas. Um, so I've had three of my four grandparents pass away of cancer, um, but no breast cancer. Um, and my whole family was on edge waiting for the results so they knew if they needed to have the test done too. So um, how did I get it? I, I, it's a mystery. So don't just don't think because oh it doesn't run in my family that you can't get it. Um, I also heard that the more you breastfeed, or you know when you breastfeed, it's supposed to decrease your chances of getting cancer. I got cancer while I was nursing, you know. Um, hmm. And I also heard I don't know if this is true that if your parents don't get cancer, that decreases your chances. Well, neither one of my parents have cancer; they're still alive and healthy. So. It's just part of your story. Right? It's just part of my story, and um, God allowed it to happen for a reason, and he has made me a much better person out of it. There you go. There you go. Well, thank you, Andrea, for thank sharing you for your story. I think it's really awesome, and I think that it's um, <laughs> tearing up the studio. We're kind of snug tonight. Um, I did have some follow-up questions. What made you decide to do the genetic testing? Your mom? Um, my mom. I'm a little older and wiser now than I was when she first started suggesting it. Um, my aunt's experience, I think, and knowing what my grandmother had to go through as well. Mm -hmm. And then when we start talking about family trees and family history, like my great-grandmother died in her middle 30s. And here I am in my 30s. And it's like, oh, maybe it's time. I probably should try this and right. see. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And I know I've had one or two cousins that have gone through the testing as well, and they're waiting for results and okay. things like that, too. So, Well, then we'll have you to lean on in this good. process. Sounds great. And you had mentioned, and I don't think you mentioned it tonight, but in your type-up that you'd sent me, that the double mastectomy was, mastectomy was the worst surgery oh my goodness. of your life. It was way worse than having a kid fly out of you. Like, it was <laughs> awful, but awesome at the same time. Like, that first week, it was just... Like, I don't know where that first week went because I was so out of it from having mm -hmm. so much trauma happen to my body. Mm -hmm. Like, it was just everybody had to do everything for me. And it was, and I am not that person. I'm like, I do it mm -hmm. myself. So my mom was funny because she put a board in front of me, a whiteboard, and she'd ask me, what's your goal today? And I would say, to button my own pants, to wipe mm -hmm. my own butt, <laughs> to like <laughs> different things in front of me. But that first week, it was, I've had ACL replacement, and that was bad, but not... Double mastectomy was really bad. I don't know why anybody would ever want to get an implant in their body because it's just, it's, yeah. it was painful. But I would totally do it all over again because it was totally worth it. Don't even notice it now. Good. My Good. newbies feel normal and your newbie I don't wear a bra ever. Ever. I don't either, except I only have one. So. <laughs> true, true. so it does look kind of weird, yeah. but you know. You have to. It was good. There I you was, go. There you I do it all over as well. Yeah. Yeah. Too. There you go. Wear a bra. You don't have to wear a bra. <laughs> but if you, want to. you don't want to, no bra. Brittany Outlaw, don't. Yeah, but if you <laughs> don't want to, I wear Brittany Outlaw's <laughs> undershirts because I love them. Okay. Let's get on with the show <laughs> here, ladies. You know how it gets me going. Three ladies here. Yeah, I know. I, I might still be up to go to yoga in the morning at <laughs> five thirty. I told Brian um, when I was coming home, he's like, "Yeah, right. I'll be in bed." <laughs> All right, well, now it's time for Dr. Ramirez. <laughs> it feels weird. Either way, it feels weird. It's your turn to shine. So um, 
we have heard two moving stories tonight and unfortunately I'm probably sure you hear them quite often. Um, do you have any initial thoughts after hearing these stories tonight? Well, honestly, so I had never met you ladies before tonight and just had briefly read through your stories that Rian had sent me. Um, but what strikes me, honestly, the first thing is the presence of God in both of your stories. Mm -hmm. So just how God can use something that's negative mm -hmm. um, for our own good. And so I think that's important. It's an important perspective for patients to remember going into this is that no, no cancer diagnosis is good or family history mm -hmm. of cancer is good, but, but we're not promised all good here. Right. Either. So, um, and then the other thing that really strikes me is the importance of, um, knowing your family history because not everyone is a candidate for genetic testing. Right. Uh, you know, and it's several thousands of dollars. I mean, your insurance isn't going to approve it if you don't, you can't say, okay, here's my family history of, of cancer. And so just knowing your own body, and we'll talk a little later in one of your questions about self-breast exam, like I always say, it's important to know your own body. So yes, in your situation, a 31-year-old with who's breastfeeding, it's not going to be first thing on your mind sure. that you're going to have breast cancer. But to know, okay, yes, that's most I understand what she said, but I'm going to go back and ask again. I mean, nobody wants to be that annoying patient, but you do have to yeah. talk to your doctors. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I mean, the incidence of cancer in someone less than 49 is like 2%. So that's one of every 50 women who's less than 49 is going to get breast diagnosed with breast cancer. But that doesn't matter if you're the person who had diagnosed mm -hmm. breast right. cancer. Right. So the, the numbers don't always represent how many families and lives are touched with it. So Right. Wow. So, yeah. so 49 is kind of a marker. Well, um, there's different ages have different rates. So we'll oh, get okay. to that in the okay. other questions. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So that kind of leads into the next question. Mm -hmm. What What is the percentage of women with some type of breast cancer. Right, so it's the most common cause of cancer death worldwide, okay, and it's um, all women, so of every age, your lifetime risk is gonna be 12.4%. So basically, <clears throat> like six of every 50 women. Okay. So if you take 50 Facebook friends, mm -hmm. um, six of those, six of those women, wow. it's 50 Facebook women friends. So right. The incidence is like 100 times more likely in a woman than in a man. And you asked later about men, men. men um, breast cancer. They can get it, but it's less than 0.5% of all cancers in men. So mm -hmm. it's very rare. That's one thing too, that my son could carry the genetic he could. marker and then he could either develop something or pass it on to his uh, children right. as well. So both it's just kids. like having brown eyes and blue eyes. It's a genetic, yep. it's 50-50 okay. chance of getting it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so, so, so it is important to you know, we always say the person with the breast cancer is the best person to be tested for the gene first, because okay. if it's negative, like in your story, then your kids don't have to worry about being tested. But if it's positive, like your story, then it will be important for you to talk to your kids about it. So. On that note, my daughter at the age of 21 will start have to getting mammograms from what Correct. I've been told. Well, I mean, it, yeah, usually, yes, because we say 10 years younger Before than the youngest family it. member. So, yeah, at a, quite a young age. Oh, wow. at, at what, like, do you know a percentage of um, girls that, like, their moms have had breast cancer? What's the percentage of them getting it, especially if I was negative? Um, yeah, I don't have that percentage. But I, I can tell you, related to that, the majority of breast cancer happens in people who do not have a family history. So wow. even though genetically it does markedly increase your risks, like the average population is 12% and you, it was up to 80%. 80%. Yeah. So yes, your individual risk is higher, but the majority of cancer is going to happen in someone who does not have a family history. Interesting. Mm -hmm. My, uh, another family member that I have is like that as well. Hmm. So, wow. so it's, it is one of those things that I don't think we're meant to fully understand, but we can use all the available research and at least do what Okay. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And with today's new technology and advanced science, I mean, it's getting better. Oh, it's huge. It's getting better. Actually, yeah, so. you, in your questions you sent me, um, so 
to, along those lines. So in the United States, each year, 260,000 breast cancer diagnoses a year, okay? But only 40,000 deaths. So, and part of that is um, screening, improved mm -hmm. screening, but a big part of it is improved treatment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, mm -hmm. the technology is, I mean, advancing. advancing. So, I mean, a lot of these cancers are, you are able to treat them so and survive them. Um, the other important thing is, it is usually detected early of okay. women who are going to the doctor. So mm -hmm. the majority of breast cancers are found confined to the breast. So okay. it's going to be stage one or two. Okay. And so obviously it's going to be much easier to treat with mm -hmm. a mastectomy or local treatment mm -hmm. versus in your story, you know, needing a much more extensive mm -hmm. treatment regimen to, to try to cure it. I had a question and I lost it. <laughs> Oh, is it just, I always hear it's stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. Is stage four the the highest yes. stage? Okay. In all cancers. You can have stage zero as well. Yes, which just means you don't know. So it's zero. small enough that it's just an, oh, okay. something could possibly pre -cancer be there, but it, just, it's not no. pre-cancer. Basically, when we do, um, like, well, I guess I'm thinking of BIRADS, if you, well, you guys have had mammograms. Um, so BIRADS zero basically means we're not quite sure we need to do more imaging. Um, but yeah, like a stage zero can sort of be a, maybe a precancerous lesion. Mm -hmm. And even little pepper specks or something of, of possibility. And even mammograms have, now they have the, the 3D where, you know, you can, it's almost like opening up a book and it, oftentimes you don't have to have um, an ultrasound with it. So even mammograms have really advanced. Oh, markedly changed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah my doctor told me I get to schedule that when I go see him in December. No, you, just have to make, you just have to make sure that your insurance will cover the I've embraced one. it. Um, yeah. The first time they offered it to me, I said no, because I didn't know if my insurance offered it. But on my way last year to get it, um, they said, yeah, they, they offer it. So Most do now, yeah. honestly. But it's yeah. always helpful to check. Well, since we're talking about mammograms, we have a question from the audience, and it happens to be from my mother. Thank you for participating, Mom. Hello. She wants to know how often a woman should get a mammogram and what age should they start. Well, I think they should start at age 40. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you know the difficulty with any medical recommendation is that it depends on what research you're looking at. So what we can do is take all of the research and give our best our best recommendation. So most studies say start at 40, and this is an average risk person. So I'm not going to really talk about your BRCA1 right, or just average. that's all different. But if you don't have a super strong family history, then the recommendations are to start at 40. Some insurances will cover a baseline mammogram at 35. So some women opt to do that, particularly if they have some family history. Um, and then right now, the guidelines are technically every two years in your 40s. Most of us, though, will still say we give our patients the option because insurance still covers it every year. Oh. So, yeah. So because at less than 49, your risk is still only 2%. So mm -hmm. um, the research actually says every two years in your 40s and then every one to two years after that based on family history. Okay. So most women plan when you turn day four out, turn your first mammogram, it's not so bad. It's really not. Yeah. It's <laughs> not not turning 40 or the mammogram. Oh, so I, I still have five years yet, but the mammogram isn't that bad. <laughs> Both are not that bad. But yeah, and then. How um, would you compare it to shooting a, what, what, would, what would you say? Shooting a baby out? Shooting a baby out. <laughs> 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 Um, and then, you know, the other end of the spectrum is uh, most of the studies say to stop screening at 75 or if your life expectancy is less than 10 years. So if you have a lot of other health issues that are probably going to take you in the next 10 years, then you can stop getting <laughs> your breast. Don't worry <laughs> about breast. <laughs> okay. So, well, I anyway. You know. Yeah. I mean, that's um, when I'm going to start eating dessert at every meal. Right. Like, doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Chocolate. All day long. All I only eat is <laughs> okay. So you briefly mentioned breast self exams. Mm -hmm. I feel like I was told or heard that they don't really like do anything. Yeah, so actually that's true. The, the studies 
show that self breast exams don't help and that even clinical breast exams or your doctor doing breast exams oftentimes can lead to overdiagnosis. So mm -hmm. I feel a lot of, then I recommend additional screening and it's just a cyst or nothing. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, you feel wrong not at least doing something. Um, and I, like I mentioned earlier, I just think knowing your own body is important. Mm -hmm. So I don't ever recommend to my patients a true monthly self breast exam. It's not necessary anymore, but I do say know your own breasts. So if you have a new lump, a new change, and basically, the other thing you mentioned is it's really hard to know what you're feeling for. It's really hard to know what you're Absolutely. looking for. So the thing that I tell patients is if it's a change for your breast, okay, but it's mostly a solid, not movable lump um, that is irregularly shaped. So the little BB like mm -hmm. feeling, that's probably okay. Mm -hmm. It's the irregular, firm, not movable lump mm -hmm. um, or Worse yet, okay, like in your story, is the, the localized changes. So more advanced disease can include um, some redness on your skin, mm -hmm. some dimpling or some, some skin changes that are either red, flaky, itchy, dimpling, mm -hmm. or even some enlarged lymph nodes into your arm. And my breast was significantly larger as well. And if I leaned on it wrong, it did hurt. So it's not like, yeah, I mean, you know. we generally say breast pain does not equal breast cancer. So in a true sense, like if you have pain in both your breasts, it's probably nothing to worry about. You mm -hmm. should still mention it to your doctor, especially if it's new right. for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but pain is not always associated with cancer unless it's a little more advanced and then it certainly can be. So speaking of that, are there any other symptoms that would go along with it that women should be aware of? Not really, unfortunately. I mean, it's just the change in the breast tissue and or on the skin itself. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I felt totally fine. Mm -hmm. And so then you did mention doing a, a breast exam, like even clinically sometimes can lead to overdiagnosis. So you have a lot of maybe false positives mm -hmm. with that mm -hmm. just because it's so. Sure. I mean, most of the mammograms that I order are negative. I mean, most of the time, especially in a younger patient, I might say, oh, you know, this breast feels different than this breast. Mm -hmm. um, let's go ahead and get some pictures, whether that's an ultrasound or a mammogram. And most of the time it's fine, mm -hmm. but I, you have to operate under the small chance that it's not going to be fine. Um, and the other thing I tell, especially younger patients, is give it two months. Two months typically isn't going to make or break anything. If it goes away, mm -hmm. well, then you don't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. So if you're not quite sure and you're doing your self-breast exams, you know, our breasts can change with, with hormones, with stress, with caffeine. Mm -hmm. So if you're a young woman without a strong family history and you wait two months and it goes away, well, then mm -hmm. you saved yourself additional imaging and stress mm -hmm. and anxiety about it. But if it's not going away, then that's definitely one to mention. Well, I don't know about you guys out there, but I know that two months I would not be able to wait. I'm yeah, like, no, we're doing it. And that's fine. <laughs> I mean, like you said, it all depends on your personality. Yeah. If you are the type of person that's going to lose sleep about knowing that gene, maybe you don't want to get the test. Right. Um, because there's, I mean, mm -hmm. If it's going to ruin your quality of life. Right. That's what we were given. Like the genetic counselor said, if you, do you want to know these results? And if you do, you know, is it going to ruin your quality of life knowing that you have this genetic marker in your mm -hmm. body that mm -hmm. you can't change? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, right. What are you going to do about it? Right. When you do know. Um, a nurse on our show in the audience said that bloody nipple discharge would be another. Yeah. That's a very good point. Um, so obviously in your case, you were breastfeeding, but anytime you have nipple discharge of any kind, you should mention it to your doctor. But the scariest types are the, the bloody or greenish color. Those are never normal. So you always want to mention that. Well, what would cause it to be bloody? Just like if there's it's, a cancerous mm -hmm. tumor in there and it's... Mm -hmm. Or it could just be irritation of the duct, but yes, if it's... And um, it's true that they say that most breast cancer starts in the duct, right? Uh, I don't know if I can, I, I believe so, but I don't know if, if I have the statistics on that. Okay. Was there anything else that you wanted to say about what can we do to help detect it or? I don't think with there? detection, okay. not okay. really. What about anything that we can do to lessen our risks or yeah, prevent? So, <laughs> this was an interesting question. Um, and you mentioned some examples in your right. in your wording, and, and none of those actually play a role. But we were talking about this a little bit before we went live. Um, the incidence of breast cancer in North America is actually pretty high. And so what the studies 
show is that they believe that's due to our fat intake and our body weight. So we we believe that obesity, what that does is you convert more hormones in your body to estrogen, and estrogen usually is going to feed um, female cancers, so oh, wow. breast or uterine, okay? Um, and the other thing is fewer pregnancies or waiting until you're older to have your first baby. So that... Define older. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, probably mid-30s or later, which is not too old to have a baby it's just if that's your first baby then you've gone more years without being pregnant or breastfeeding mm -hmm. and you mentioned it earlier too so for the statistic is for every 12 months of breastfeeding you decrease your risk of breast cancer by four percent so if you have five kids and you breastfeed each for a year you're decreasing wow. your risk Sweet. of breast I'm cancer two percent yes <laughs> <laughs> well i nursed my last my second and last child for over a year right so so i mean some of it is it is. so while he was still nursing yeah you know so, <laughs> obviously yeah. i am the oddball here. <laughs> so so yeah statistics like i mentioned i mean they're just that they're just statistics right and, and it it's not going to define everybody's story exactly. but um the other stuff that i found so i actually did a little bit of research on this myself just to see if there was anything else that you could do um Alcohol and smoking slightly increase your risk of breast cancer, which sort of makes sense. Any sure I mean, tobacco is going to increases lots of other cancers mm -hmm. in your body. Um, what I found really interesting, unfortunately, for our nurses out there, is that working the night shift mm -hmm. slightly increases your risk of getting breast cancer. Hmm. And I would have to look into that more um, to see like why the or, night shift or or is that or how how reliable is that research? Because again, like I mentioned. A lot of this stuff you really have to dig into the quality of the research right but i did find something about that um, so stay tuned there's going to be a lot of night shift opening right <laughs> right <laughs> just i'm picturing all my labor and delivery night shift nurses out there you're gonna be like where did they go <laughs> um and what then you said the only other thing i found is that the mediterranean diet or fruits and vegetables may have a very slight um, decrease in your risk consuming fruits and vegetables mm -hmm. or or the Mediterranean diet Type diet so, so Google is going to get hit with what is the Mediterranean diet so it's basically your fish a lot of greens and probably um, fruits and vegetables probably. some fruits and vegetables but it's you know a lot of like olives because those are your healthy mm -hmm. fats because mm -hmm. um, I've looked into it and you said our fat intake so you're not meaning like our healthy fats, like avocados, right. coconut oil, that kind of thing. It's more like cookies. Like we had tonight. Yeah. <laughs> the French fries. And fries. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the Everything stuff. I had at Freddy's tonight. Yeah. So oh. basically just <laughs> try to be healthy. Well, right. I mean, if you picture, <laughs> if you picture trying to live a healthy lifestyle in mm -hmm. general, that's going to go along with decreasing right. your cancer risk. Right. But some of it is genetics mm -hmm. and some of it is just that's the plan for you mm -hmm. and there's not a lot you can do right. about it. Absolutely. And for those of you watching what I had in my notes, um, I went, wondered if like deodorant, cause I heard deodorant and dryer sheets, fabric softener can lead to breast cancer. And then I wondered if maybe if we need to be eating organically to help decrease. Right. And I mean, again, you had mentioned things that we put in our food. I found just one, one very small mention of, Red meats or processed meats in really high quantities can slightly mm -hmm. increase your risk. But the studies on that are questionable. So again, it's one of those things where I think trying to eat healthy, I don't I think you could drive yourself crazy if you really absolutely stressed about every little thing that you put in your body. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just, well, leave it up to God because you can't really right. control it. Absolutely. But but yeah, certainly I think it makes sense that less processed foods are gonna be better for you. Of course. In for so many things. Mm -hmm. And I just heard on the radio this morning that new studies have come out that red meat might not be as bad for us as they once said. And that's where I get so frustrated. I don't know about you guys. It's right. like one day, don't eat apples. And the next day, oh no, have five apples. And carbs are good. Carbs, carbs are, are bad. bad. Yeah, all of these things. So you just gotta find what works for you and right. try to stick within like the healthy guidelines. In moderation. Yeah, absolutely. I was told you eat like your grandmother. Eat like your grandmother used to, where they go oh. out to the garden, pick oh, everything, yeah. bring it in, not go to the store to buy cans. Like ice time. cream every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's what that's what somebody that I was talking to said. Just eat like your grandmother or your great grandmother would. Like, 
Those are more fresh, fresh foods. I mean, yeah. just think of our ancestors, you know, all the stuff that the gardening and stuff that they did. They didn't have readily available stuff. And I, I also had a question that I have heard that if you like carry your phone like in your bra, can that increase your oh. chance? So that's a good question. So there's um, always a worry about radiation. So I have some patients that say, well, I don't want to get mammograms because the radiation from the mammogram is going to cause breast cancer. So mm -hmm. I don't. I, I'm afraid of mammograms, essentially. Uh, and that kind of would go along with cell phone, mm -hmm. you know, really any sort of radiation exposure. Um, and for an average woman, uh, it has definitely been proven that your screening mammograms, the radiation exposure from that is minimal and it's not going to increase your risk. Now, actually, it specifically did mention your BRCA carriers. That may be a different story because yeah. you're going to get a lot more imaging if you don't have your mastectomy. Right, right. Um, so a lot more, I mean, we usually recommend a yearly MRI and a yearly mammogram, oh, right. both, plus maybe some additional. So I mean, it's, that can maybe. Right, and I still get time. a three to five year MRI, just to make sure nothing's ruptured or okay. developed behind my implants, because right. I still. Like rupture? Like my, oh, implants, implants. Implants. my gummy bears, yeah. Gummy bears. Yeah. My gummy okay. bears. And that's always scary as a physician <laughs> for a patient with a history of breast cancer with implants, because you're, your clinical breast exam is really limited right. to know what they And there's still like, like breast tissue entwined in your muscles that they can't see. scrape out I and see. take out when they're in there. Okay. So that's why you saw that 8 to 10% chance. Sure. Another question from the audience wants to know, what's the consensus on sleeping in a bra? Uh, I've not heard, seen any research that that matters. That's one way or the other. It's not, yeah, why would you do that? Mine comes off as soon as I am walking in. I was driving down the building. I was saying I don't wear one, you know? So, I went through a phase where I didn't sleep in my bra because it was a comfort thing. Like, it was like, <gasps> weird. it held the ladies in. I was big, ladies. It held and men. I was big, too. And, I, it, and it didn't flop you in the face. Yeah, so, like, it just was uncomfortable for him to be free. Okay. Yeah. And then note, a, a long lines of the, sorry. the radiation, um, like for non-Hodgkin's, like lymphoma, or people mm -hmm. who have had chest wall radiation, that's actually going to increase your risk of breast cancer too. So I, should, I wouldn't care. I mean, I don't do, it, but I mean, I've had radiation there, so mm -hmm. I don't right. carry it in there. But yeah. So I don't. I haven't seen any specific studies on that, but you do always wonder. wonder. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I see like one lady at my church, like she'll stick it in there, and just like. Oh, I don't want to. I, I don't want to say anything to her because I want to be like, hey, you know. But that I don't really know, right? The sure. research and statistics, it's right? Just buying what people said. So. Sure. Another question that we have from our audience, which we'll probably talk about here later, but while I see it, because mm -hmm. it's from my mama, so I don't want to <laughs> ignore her. Your mom's really cute. Oh. I need to meet her sometime. Did you hear that, mom? You're really cute. Oh. I take after my mom. <laughs> <laughs> You're really cute too. Give me a compliment. <laughs> oh, jeez. Does having a complete hysterectomy decrease your chances of breast cancer? Of breast cancer, I'm assuming. Does it decrease? That was one of my questions. Like, does having one type of cancer increase your risks of having a different type of cancer? The short answer is yes. That Be having one does increase your chances. Of yes, okay. but the reason being is because of twofold. Sometimes it's the medications or the radiation we have to do to treat the one cancer can increase your risk. So in her case, mm. she would have been at increased risk of uterine cancer because of the treatment that she's taking for her breast cancer. And that's why you have this trick. Well, plus the hormones. Right. So because my cancer was estrogen and progesterone receptor positive, um, that's why I had the hysterectomy mm -hmm. because my um, chemo pill that I take every day um, could increase the chance. I thought it was cervical cancer, but maybe it's you know, right here. And then in BRCA, but even some other genetic um, markers that we don't even maybe know to test for, we know mm -hmm. that cancers tend to run together. So colon, mm -hmm. uterine, breast, they, you know, pancreatic even. So um, we don't know why, but it has mm -hmm. to be some genetic glitch in your system mm -hmm. that causes those cells to go haywire. So it's not, I don't know that it's necessarily having breast cancer that increases your risks of other cancers. It's just whatever genetic predisposition is there, is there for right. multiple other cancers right. as well. And that's what our family tree looks like. We have the colon cancer, the breast cancer, the ovarian cancer, mm -hmm. it's all across the board. Okay. So a full hysterectomy would, in, I guess the shortest way to answer that is it could. 
decrease your risk. She gave a follow up. Yes, breast cancer because of the lack of hormones. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it could decrease your risks of breast cancer because of the lack of estrogen that that you now have you know eliminated. But it's not uterus. It would have to be ovaries. So Mm -hmm. because if you remove the uterus, that's not affecting your hormones at all. It's that would have to be the ovaries. It's like an ophthalmic. So with that being <laughs> another question that I had, um, different types of breast cancer. So hers was the estrogen for just whatever positive. Mm-hmm. So that it would just decrease that ch- risk of or of getting that type, but are there other types oh, that well and I don't know if inflammatory breast cancer is specific different. to ERBR receptor positive because I think there have been people that I have talked to that haven't that have had like one positive, one negative. So it's it's just the type of cancer that it is, and I can describe it really quick and you probably know. But my oncologist said inflammatory breast cancer, typically cancer is on the top of the surface or on the bottom, but inflammatory kind of goes like in between, like you know, like your skin. So like if you take your flap of skin, you see the so it's kind of there. So which is why even if, or even though that my chemo got rid of the tumor, I still needed the mastectomy because my breast still wouldn't be the same. It's still going to be mm. larger and just the way that it was. So it's it's all about how that's why I call it inflammatory because it's affecting, it's not just on your skin or underneath, it's actually mm-hmm. inside, okay. which is why they did the skin biopsy to confirm that it mm-hmm. was that as well. Yeah, so the types of breast cancer are really varied in and it, it could get really detailed, but mm-hmm. the most common type is infiltrating ductal carcinoma. So we mentioned starting in the duct. Mm-hmm. 70 to 80% of breast cancer is going to be that, okay? And then, but then you have other types too. You have your infiltrating lobular, which is 8%, mixed type of the two. And then you have all sorts of other kinds, metaplastic, mucinous, tubular, papillary, wow. or you can get a breast sarcoma, which is very rare, but mm-hmm. so there's... And then, and then in addition to that, then you have your molecular subtypes. So your ER positive or negative, your PR or oh progesterone gosh. positive or negative, and then your HER2 positive or negative. And I was negative for that, um, which was another thing she, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I forgot, which was another thing for her to know on how she could do my treatment. Right. So, and, and since I'm not an oncologist, I'm, you know, I wouldn't even be the best person to explain sure. all the different types of breast cancer, but the ER positive is also the most common. Mm-hmm. So, but I believe you can have ER positive with lots of different types of cancer. So wow. that it's a really complex way to diagnosis, diagnose it. And honestly, the, the only way you can is with a biopsy mm-hmm. of okay. whatever you're talking about. Okay. We've kind of jumped around, so I'm kind of a little bit <laughs> looking at my questions here. It looks like we talked about men can get breast cancer, but it's a hundred percent higher chance for women. Yeah, right. To have and it. almost all the time, if a man if a man gets breast cancer, they are going to have multiple first degree relatives that have had breast cancer, mm-hmm. and most likely they're a BRCA carrier. So that's almost exclusively. Uh, okay. So if you have an uncle or a grandfather or someone that had breast cancer, you best be getting some genetic testing <laughs> because it's, I mean, it could certainly be okay. running in your family. So, um, and then you also asked uh, as far as genetics go. Mm-hmm. So clearly first degree relatives are the most concerning. So mom, sister, daughter, mm-hmm. um, those are going to be our primary person, people that we look at as far as risk factors, but also multiple second or third degree relatives also is okay. going to be increasing your risk. So, I mean, really, it's a whole picture. If you had one great aunt that had breast cancer, it's probably not going to markedly increase your risk. But the, the greater the number of people mm-hmm. is going to increase your risk. And also if they were premenopausal. So the younger breast cancers are more of our concern. Right. Um, under 49, right. 2% chance. Right. So if you had someone who had that, now we need to watch you more closely because mm-hmm. we don't normally watch younger mm-hmm. women as closely as older mm-hmm. women. Sure. Um, you know, I, you asked about other risk factors. So mm-hmm. like I mentioned, less than 49 is 2%. 50 to 59 is still only 2.3%. Okay. But you get greater than 70 and you're at 6.7%. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, as with all cancers, the older your cells get, the more of a percentage of chance that you're going to sure. get some sort of cancer. So if you had premenopausal or younger women in your family have breast cancer, that's going to markedly increase your risk. 
So that's good to know. That's mm -hmm. good to know. Were there any other risk factors besides age, really? White women. White women, okay. And obesity. And obesity. Mm -hmm. That's it seems like that O word plays into a lot it of things. Sure does. And then not ever having children, whether that's by okay. choice or just because you weren't able to, that okay. is going to increase your risk. So having babies and breastfeeding babies is protective. And unfortunately, it's not always in our control. Some women are able to breastfeed or some women are able to conceive. And so, I mean, a lot of these risk factors aren't really modifiable. You can't right. change your race or, you know, your genetics. Um, and sometimes change you your age once a year. <laughs> <laughs> and mine stays 25 every year. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yes. Good to know. Yeah, it's good. good I decided that this year. Yeah. 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 See, I'll never right. have my... Strike me. So always be 25. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. I'm looking over. It looks like you've covered most of the questions that I had. Do you have any other notes that you wanted to share, Erin? Um, I guess the only other thing I wanted to mention it kind of goes along with your mom's question, which is because cancers tend to run together, if you've had any type of cancer diagnosis, then you want to be really careful to stay up on your screen for other kinds of cancer. So okay. getting your routine colonoscopy, getting your mammogram, mm -hmm. you know, getting the other, you know, right going to your doctor and, mm -hmm. and kind of going over any changes because just because you had breast cancer doesn't mean you couldn't get colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to know that. Right. necessarily if we're not looking for it. So mm -hmm. I think that was one of the, the other things that I think is helpful for uh, patients. And then also that the largest recurrence of breast cancer is going to be in the first five years. So, and that's true of a lot of cancers. Okay. You're, you're almost out. <laughs> you're almost out. <laughs> so, so the first five years is where you're always going to do more surveillance, um, more frequently. And then the longer you're a survivor, mm -hmm. then the less often Okay, your imaging and your visits get. So okay. time is, is your friend. Now you mentioned um, because cancers run together, like if you've had one, what about in Andrea's case where she didn't have it, higher risk for others? Yes, yeah. for sure. Okay, what about precancerous situations? Uh, um, you didn't really have cancer, it was... No, I wouldn't say that then you would necessarily okay. be higher risk for okay. others. Okay, all right, very good. Um, that's all my questions. I mean, what time is it? Midnight. I know seven. So it's like, oh, oh, not too bad. We went after ten. Great. Oh my gosh, ladies, I'm so sorry. <laughs> all right. Do you guys have anything else to add? I really appreciate you guys. Be proactive. Sharing yeah. your stories. Be proactive. Be an advocate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think for yourself. And like Erin said, just just know your body. Um, I after I think after I had my. Um, reduction done, I found it was on the surface, but it was a teeny tiny like little spot. Um, and my oncologist wasn't worried, I really wasn't worried, but she bumped up my mammogram just to check it. And it was just normal scar tissue that was there. Um, but because I had had it already, even though my whole left side is clear, you could never be too, too cautious. Mm -hmm. So just even something little like that, yeah, it was right on the surface. It was, you know, kind of, I don't know, probably can't see it size of a nickel probably. Um, but you can just never be too cautious, especially since I had just, you know, hypersensitive, right? Yeah. And like I said, I really wasn't worried because my oncologist didn't really freak out, you know, and she, she was, you know, not really concerned, but it was nice that she moved it up because I think she kind of knew me, you know, not to stop worry about it, you know, cause we do that. Mm -hmm. Um, but just any little thing, it's worth getting checked out because right. you never know if it could be that. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. How many of us are going to go lay in our bed tonight? And <laughs> At least get the baseline, right? Like, what does that feel like? What does it look like? All right. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm so sorry it ran so late, but I know this is fun. Seen yeah. some comments already right. that people have really, really yeah. appreciated yeah. this. Yeah, so, it's yeah, very helpful. Thank you, thank you to all my viewers for staying with us. Remember, if you're catching the replay, to hashtag replay so you can, so I can know and go back and check your questions. Um, make sure you stay tuned next week. Next week's a surprise. I'm not going to tell you what we're doing. So we'll see you next week, guys. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Let me get up here and be all awkward in your face right now. And. and.